Hello everyone, this is Natasha and I'm back with the second video on Environment and Ecology course. So today we are going to discuss a very important topic that is functions of an ecosystem. In this we'll cover these main heads, energy flow, nutrient cycling and ecological succession. And these are the respective subheads which we are going to discuss in detail. Remember, this topic is very important for UPSC civil services examination. OK, so let's start now. So first of all, let us see what is energy flow. Energy flow in, in an ecosystem shows the movement of an energy from producers to top level consumers. This means that energy moves from the lowest trophic level in a food chain to the highest trophic level. That is, energy moves from plants or autotrophs or producers to primary consumers or heterotrophs such as deer or rabbit. From there, energy moves to secondary consumers such as wolf or snake. And from there, it moves to the highest trophic level, which is of tertiary consumers such as lion or vulture. Okay. The next point is it is represented with the help of trophic level as we have discussed. The trophic level determines the position of an organism in a food chain. For example, plants or autotrophs are at the lowest trophic level in a food chain and tertiary consumers such as lion or vulture are at the highest trophic level in a food chain. Okay? Energy flow is unidirectional. So why flow of energy is an, in an ecosystem is said to be unidirectional. Understand this because some energy is lost in form of heat when moving from one trophic level to next for the maintenance of homeostasis of an organism and thus each successive trophic level receive a less amount of energy as compared to the preceding trophic level. Let's understand this more clearly in the next statement that is the energy decreases from the lower trophic levels to the higher trophic levels by 10% rule. And hence, the energy available at the higher level is very less. For example, at the lowest trophic level of plants or autotrophs or producers, the energy is 100%. But as we go above in a food chain to the next trophic level, the energy left with primary consumers or heterotrophs is just 10%. Above that, the energy left with the secondary consumers is just 1% and above that, the energy left with the tertiary consumers is just 0.1% and that happens as per 10% rule, right? So therefore, on the land ecosystem, not more than 4 or 5 trophic level will be possible, while in aquatic ecosystem, 6 to 7 trophic levels are possible. This is denoted with the help of food chain. So next time if a question is asked that why it is so that on the land ecosystem not more than 4 or 5 trophic level is possible and on the aquatic 6 to 7. So you have to give this reason that energy decreases as per 10% rule, right? So in this we have two types of food chains that is grazing food chain and detritus food chain, okay? So now let's see what is grazing food chain. We have already discussed this. Now we'll discuss this by diagram. I hope you all are making notes side by side. And if you are, please also draw this diagram. OK, so as we can see at the lowest trophic level is plants or autotrophs or producers where 100 percent energy is available. As we move above in a food chain, there are primary consumers or heterotrophs where 10 percent energy is available. Energy is decreased by 10% rule, remember, okay? As we move above, 1% energy is available and at the highest trophic level of tertiary consumers, only 0.1% energy is available. So the next question arises here, what are the typical examples of these trophic levels, okay? So plants or autotrophs can be grass, plants, okay, you know that. Then the primary consumers or heterotrophs can be deer, rabbit, grasshopper, and of course, man, right? Secondary consumers can be wolf, snake, lizard, and man. And tertiary consumers are eagle, 
lion and vulture etc similarly we have a grazing food chain in aquatic ecosystem for which typical examples can be uh, phytoplankton at the lowest trophic level above that zooplankton then small fish then large fish and above that of course shark right so now we have detritus food chain so see it starts from dead and decayed organic matter the dead organic matter is decomposed by decomposers such as fungus and bacteria while it is eaten by detritivores such as vultures see this is the dead matter and decomposers decompose it for example fungus or bacteria and detritivores eat this dead matter for example rats eagles crow vultures earthworms etc so guys one important thing to uh, remember here is that these two food chains that is grazing food chain and detritus food chains are linked together see how it is linked first the dead matter of grazing food chain is actually the initial source of energy for detritus food chain okay and second how is it linked that the top level predators of both the food chains are common okay so now uh, the detritus food chain is economically very important see how it causes humification of soil and also increases the soil fertility it also helps in addition of minerals in the soil it helps in breaking down of rocks to form the soil we can make biogas which is an energy source and we can also make biofertilizers from it which will be helpful in sustainable agriculture right the next very important topic under energy flow is ecological pyramids so there are three types of ecological pyramids that is pyramid of numbers pyramid of biomass and pyramid of energy uh, this topic is very important for your mains examination and don't forget to make a note right uh, okay so now, now let's discuss each one of them in detail so first one is pyramid of numbers see on terrestrial ecosystem pyramid of numbers can be upright as well as inverted how it is upright at the lowest trophic level there are trees producers then above that we can find insects lizards snakes and at the highest trophic level there can be animals such as hawk that is quite obvious but how it is inverted that is just because of a single tree a tree is obviously an autotroph or a producer but we can find that on a single tree there are so many different species that are usually found at different trophic level in an ecosystem for example on a single tree we can also find insects birds or snakes and this is the reason why it is inverted on terrestrial ecosystem okay but pyramid of numbers are always upright in an aquatic ecosystem for example at the lowest trophic level there are phytoplankton above that there are zooplankton then medium fish large fish then shark all right so simple the next is pyramid of biomass so a pyramid of biomass as you can see is a graphical representation of biomass present in a unit area of various trophic levels okay so it shows the relationship between biomass and trophic level quantifying the biomass available in each trophic level of an energy community at a given time okay so see on terrestrial ecosystem pyramid of biomass is upright why because if a bar of producers is representing a tree it will be largest as it has more mass than the primary consumers okay but it is inverted in an aquatic ecosystem because phytoplankton or producers are microscopic remember this keywords producers in an aquatic ecosystem are microscopic okay and therefore they make up less biomass than the primary consumers all right the last pyramid is pyramid of energy so we have already discussed this 
10% rule is applicable here. It is always upright because of ecological inefficiency. Only 10% of energy is transferred from one trophic level to next trophic level. Energy flow, of, uh, flow is unidirectional. We have discussed this. And because energy is decreased uh, as per 10% rule, more amount of food is eaten as we go higher in the trophic level. For example, a tertiary consumer such as lion needs more amount of food in order to balance its energy. Okay. So I hope the concept of energy flow is pretty much clear to you. So now there is one more topic that is bioaccumulation and biomagnification, which is very important. So what is bioaccumulation? So uh, let me explain this in a very simple definition. Bioaccumulation is a process by which pollutant enters the food chain while the tendency of a pollutant to increase in concentration from one trophic level to the higher trophic level is known as biomagnification. This topic is very important and you also know the features of a pollutant for it to biomagnify. The first feature is its life should be long lived. So that it doesn't get easily decayed and generally long-lived pollutants are non-biodegradable. So if a pollutant's life is short, then how it can biomagnify in a food chain? So it should be long-lived, right? The second feature is that pollutants must be mobile. So see, if a pollutant is sedentary, then how it can move from one trophic level to another? So it should be mobile so that it tra travels from one trophic level to another trophic level okay and the third feature is that a pollutant should be fat soluble so that it is retained for a long period only then if if a pollutant have these features only then it can biomagnify in a food chain this is a very very important topic now we'll discuss some examples of those pollutants due to which these concepts of bioaccumulation and biomagnification have come into being. So the first one is DDT. The full form of DDT is dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. It has been banned, okay? And it's an insecticide and a persistent organic pollutant. Its investor, inventor was given Nobel Prize. Its inventor was Paul Hermann Müller and he was given Nobel Prize for this. See, uh, he was a Swiss chemist and uh, DDT noted its effectiveness as a pesticide during World War II to control malaria and typhus among civilians and troops. And that is why he was given a Nobel Prize in 1948. But it started causing cancer in the long run. It also started causing fertility decreasing and respiratory and reproductive problems. It also started causing thinning of shells of eggs of birds and that is why this pollutant has been banned. Okay. The next one is endosulfan. It's an agrochemical. It causes imbalance of hormones and thereby causing failure of entire nervous system. It has been banned by Stockholm Convention and India banned it in 2012. The next one is diclofenac. It's a painkiller. Basically, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, which is widely used in domesticated animals, especially cattle. And diclofenac has caused death of vultures, and therefore, vultures are critically endangered in India. This is very mysterious point, right? So I have a very mysterious story. You have to li listen to it very patiently, only then you will understand why did the vultures disappear? So this is a story of a mystery, almost unbelievable connections, terrible consequences for a species, surprising ramifications and a hopeful solution. Listen to me very carefully, guys. So in the early 1990s, there were at least 80 million vultures in the Indian subcontinent. By the end of that decade, almost 99% of the vulture population disappeared, right? So how could that happen? Scientists were truly puzzled at the massive decline of all the vulture species. They examined hundreds of dead birds and concluded that kidney failure was the reason. So why did the kidneys fail? 
more research revealed that the vultures had been poisoned by a drug called diclofenac. So vultures are natural scavengers and in India dead cows are often their food. Farmers give diclofenac to their cows as a low cost painkiller. While cows could tolerate and even benefit from the drug, it was deadly poison for the vultures. Vultures began dying in huge numbers. Since vultures are slow breeders, the reproduction could not match the death rate. And in 10 years, most of the vultures were gone. But that was not all. With the vultures gone, wild dogs began eating the cows. They could withstand diclofenac and so their population soared. They also transmitted rabies virus from the carcasses and spread them to other dogs. So rabid dogs began attacking human beings and deaths due to rabies rose to 35,000 a year, highest in the world. Note that the vultures could destroy the rabies virus with their strong stomach acid. Okay, so the story goes further. Leopard found the dogs to be easy prey. Their population soared and more people were killed in man-leopard encounters. So there were other side effects of the decline of vultures. Previously, forest guards and reserves could quickly locate a dead animal by the vulture circling above the carcass. They could identify the cause of death. Now by the time they locate a dead animal, it is in a highly decomposed state. Another side story. Listen guys. The Parsi tradition is to leave their dead for vultures for consume and now there are too few of them to carry out the task. This is, but, but there is still some hope. In 2006, India, Pakistan and Nepal banned the use of diclofenac for cows. The government also set on vulture conservation centers. The vulture population in India may now be slowly increasing. So what can we learn from the vulture story, guys? First one, ours is a highly interdependent and interconnected world. Every action of ours has a series of known and unknown ramifications. Then, the diversity of life on Earth is a complex web of interconnected species. When one species declines sharply in numbers, it sets off a set series of impacts on other species. And the last thing to learn from this story is when introducing a new chemical or drug, it is best to use the precautionary principle. Okay, guys. Okay, so the government of India came with the concept of vulture restaurant, forest department officials buy dead cattle which do not contain diclofenac residue and that is how they are feeding them to vultures in order to increase their population. Some more examples of biomagnifications are uh, guys PVC, polyethylene which is used for making plastic bags, non-food grade plastic and there was also a, a case of cancer in milk drinking population especially in Punjab that was also a case of biomagnification and uh, uh, another case in this is mercury pollution. And uh, which causes Mina Mata disease. It has caused a great havoc in Japan. It started causing mental retardness in the offsprings. Okay, I think this is pretty much clear now. Okay, guys, so this is it. In our next video, we'll learn nutrient cycling and ecological succession under functions of an ecosystem. So please do like, subscribe, and share. And thank you all.